Hello there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Today's guest is Robert McCormick, an organist and choir master at St. Mark's Church in Philadelphia. He was a former director of music at St. Paul's Parish in Washington, D.C. And just recently, Robert signed a contract uh, with Philip Trackenbrot Concert Artists. In the past, he was an organist and music director at the Church of St. Mary the Virgin in New York City, one of the country's most celebrated Anglo-Catholic parishes. Only 22 years old when he assumed the position, he conducted one of the city's most highly regarded professional courses, oversaw a weekly organ recital series, and played the historic four-manual 91-rank Aeolian Skinner organ. A summa cum laude graduate in organ performance from Westminster Choir College, Princeton, New Jersey, Robert has received numerous awards. He is a frequent concert artist in such prestigious venues as the great organist series at St. John's Cathedral in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, the New York City Pipe Organ Encounters, and the Atlanta Summer Organ Festival, among many others. Known for his ability in organ improvisation, uh, Robert uh, was a semi-finalist at the St. Albans International Organ Festival Improvisation Competition. In this conversation, Robert will share his ideas about the art of organ improvisation, how he practices it, how he performs in public, and all those intricate details you wish to know. Despite some technical challenges we've been having uh, with this conversation with technology, I hope you will still find this conversation inspiring and will want to try your hand and improvisation. Let's go to the show. So, Robert, I am so delighted we're finally having this conversation despite uh, all these technical issues uh, we've been having uh, all afternoon. But uh, this will be a quick conversation and uh, I'm sure our listeners will be delighted to hear all about your organ journey, right? And welcome to the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I'm happy to speak to you. So, for starters, let me ask you this question. Um, uh, how did you first fell in love with the organ? Well, I think that my story is probably not unlike many other organists. Uh, I was very fortunate to, as a, to go as a child to a large Protestant church, uh, church in the United Methodist denomination, which uh, is a denomination in the United States that stems from the British Methodist Church uh, that had a fine pipe organ, uh, originally by E.M. Skinner and then later rebuilt by Muller uh, and with a very fine organist playing, uh, who was the musician there, and that actually still is. She's been there a very long time. And each week uh, during church, I heard the sound of the organ, and like so many organists uh, that I've met and spoken to, I fell in love with the sound uh, and became completely infatuated with the pipe organ and right. increasingly knew that that was what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Did you have any other interests besides organ at that time? I was very inclined to music and it really was my, my chief interest. And uh, I don't have any other professional musicians in my family. I'd had some, uh, great grandparents who were musically inclined, but only amateur musicians. So it was a great, great surprise to my parents and to other members of my family that I showed such an interest in an inclination towards music. I was almost as equally uh, passionate and interested in choral music uh, and in the singing of the choir. And uh, to this day, then my, my two passions, chief passions musically, are uh, playing the organ, being an organist, and being a choral director or choir trainer. Right. And um, uh, do you remember uh, what was the first organ piece that you played, Robert? I think that the organ, first organ piece I can really remember playing was a fairly simple transcription or uh, arrangement of this uh, so-called 
Psalm 19 by the uh, Italian Benedetto Marcello, Marcelli. It's been so long I should know, of course, but I can't remember. And I remember playing that when I was perhaps 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't play the organ myself until I was about that age, until I was about 11 or 12. I began studying the piano uh, a few years earlier, uh, but the piano always, for me, felt like a, a prelude, a, a warm-up, as it were, towards learning the organ. Right. And, of course, did you find uh, any challenges with the organ? What was particularly difficult for you at that time? Uh, well, I was still rather short. I'm not a particularly tall person uh, at in my adult years, uh, but I was fairly short at that time so of course there's reaching the pedal board uh, and at that age I, if we lowered the bench all the way I could just about reach the pedal board mm -hmm. so I think that one of my challenges was uh, probably showing an interest and inclination uh, in improvisation so I perhaps was a little bit reluctant to uh, work too hard on uh, organ repertoire at that age though I was very eager to get to a point where I could uh, I could play a good deal of organ repertoire. Mm -hmm. I was also impatient. Mm -hmm. I wanted to sort of be a professional organist, and I wanted to have it happen overnight. Of course, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. So I didn't always have the patience. I don't think to do technical exercises. And I, I was first taught using the Harold Gleason method, which is uh, used a lot by uh, organ teachers still in this country, uh, and it gives a really soft a technical foundation, which I had to try to be disciplined about learning to, to do uh, for both manual and pedal technique. Right. Uh, what got you interested, uh, Robert, in improvisation at the first time? I began to improvise at the piano mm -hmm. fairly soon after I began formal piano study. And I'm not sure I would say that I was the greatest at playing by ear, but I found that my fingers led me to places uh, that were off the page. And I found that I enjoyed it. And I remember asking my piano teacher uh, when I was perhaps about 10 or 11, if I could improvise for her. And she was very encouraging. Uh, she seemed to think that I had a knack for it. Uh, and so every now and then, and then she would uh, hear me or ask me to do an improvisation on something in my lessons. And she might offer a suggestion or two. We, we still spent the vast majority of our time working on piano repertoire. So it was that, that uh, interest in improvisation was nurtured in me uh, by my teacher, my piano, piano teacher. And I began to do it at the organ mm -hmm. as well. And I don't, I seriously, doubt that my efforts at that age were of great musical value but they sort of propelled me or launched me into uh, at least being willing to improvise and showing an interest in it um, and additionally uh, I grew up with a love of um, Protestant hymnody uh, the hymns of the that I I knew that we sang in church the vernacular hymns and that love has stayed with me uh, uh, and I'm now uh, am an, an Episcopalian and Anglican, and so that love of hymnody and hymn singing uh, has has stayed and moved with me as I work in a slightly different uh, religious tradition or Christian denomination. Right. And, uh, did you have any good uh, organ uh, harmony and music theory background at the time, or uh, did it come later in your life? music theory i would say the formal the formal knowledge of theory and harmony came a bit later mm -hmm. uh and though i also did theory uh as a as a teenager um i did you know sort of had a theory workbook to try to sort of get us get a sense of things and when i went to college to university uh i think i had a reasonable uh working knowledge of theory and harmony but i still had a lot of gaps to fill in so uh I think I could say that I had to fill in sort of intellectually when, when I was uh, in, in college, university, uh, what I had already been sort of doing 
on my own, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so I put this sort of, this sort of formal uh, knowledge, things that I could see and identify on paper uh, with what I had already been led to by my ear and by my wandering fingers. Mm -hmm. is, is the skill of improvisation useful to you today in your work, for example? It certainly is. Mm -hmm. uh, I improvise a great deal in uh, a liturgical context, and I have enjoyed working in churches that uh, require improvisation to cover ceremonial actions of the liturgy, and I find that very fulfilling. And I do often improvise in uh, recitals as well, uh, and people seem to enjoy that, and so I keep doing it. Uh, and uh, though it's liturgical improvisation that I find the most rewarding. Uh, and later, uh, after I went to university, uh, I studied improvisation formally for about four or five years uh, with um, McNeil Robinson, who is a great American teacher, composer, uh, teacher of repertoire and improvisation. And I would say that sort of crystallized my uh, manner of improvisation. And I think mm -hmm really gave me the formal structure that I had not had up until that point. So I'm able to call on that today. And I hope that uh, my improvisations, whether in a church service or in a recital, uh, have a grounding and structure uh, that, uh, that really was crystallized in my study with Professor Robinson. Mm -hmm. And uh, Robert, uh, can you, what can you say to organists uh, who are afraid to begin in improvisation studies or just uh, to try out new things and uh, try their hand and feet at improvisation? How would you them encourage them? Well, I would say to devote time to improvising, practice, imp practicing improvising as much as uh, they practice organ repertoire. Uh, obviously, to keep studying and practicing or organ repertoire, because the more repertoire one plays and the better one's organ technique becomes, uh, the wider vocabulary uh, one has to improvise. Mm. Uh, and then, uh, in practice at least, not to be afraid to borrow and to steal, for lack of a better word, um, ideas, gestures, harmonies from um, uh, existing composers and to uh, spend time in practicing improvisation uh, to say a model an improvisation on an existing work that uh, one already plays and to really plan to make a plan for an improvisation to find a structure, uh, even if it's a simple three-part structure, a song form or uh, a, a rondo, to try to adhere to that structure and to plan an improvisation that one might do as part of a church service, uh, to practice uh, that during the weeks before as one might have practiced a piece of repertoire and to not be at all ashamed about writing down a plan mm -hmm. and make an outline and in as much detail as, as needed. I think there's absolutely no shame in that. I think many of us know that Marcel Dupre was one of the greatest and most disciplined improvisers uh, that probably has ever existed in our, in our field. And uh, the organization that Dupre brought to the art, as so many of us know and appreciate, I think is something that we can all learn from. And we shouldn't be embarrassed to plan and prepare in advance uh, mm -hmm. to a great extent. And I found that uh, as I've become more and more comfortable improvising, doing things on the fly has become easier and easier. And I think once the, the structure uh, has been sort of uh, internalized through regular practice and planning, it becomes easier to improvise really on the fly in the moment much and still have that structure come to the fore, if that makes sense. Yes. 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 Uh, thank you. Thank you, Robert, for this detail, detailed um, insight about uh, 
uh, how people can feel uh, not afraid, right, to start uh, their uh, improvisation journey. Is it okay uh, to memorize things uh, for the sake of improvisation to use later in improvisation? How do you think? I don't think there's anything at all wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And I think this particularly if one is becoming more and more comfortable with improvising, uh, then that's a really good way to have something to fall back on in, uh, in a performance, for lack of a better word. Particularly when I was becoming more and more comfortable uh, as an improviser, I would uh, certainly spend time practicing and I would have figurations or musical gestures or harmonic progressions uh, or even imitative uh, figures that I would sort of practice and memorize. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember, um, I remember sort of practicing and virtually memorizing uh, improvisations to play in, uh, in the context of a church service. Uh, and, and I feel that really gave me a lot of confidence in advance. So I didn't need to fear the moment so much, you know, if I would get to a point of saying, oh no, what comes next? I knew I had something to fall back on. And um, at the time, that was really helpful to me. And I think as I become more comfortable and I hope more fluent as an improviser, mm -hmm. I don't need to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I still practice, you know, imp improvising and I might find something that inspires me. And I try to file maybe an idea away uh, to, to, to pull out or bring out at a later time. Here is the thing, Robert. I'm, I was always wondering about how often people uh, get the idea from their head that they planted earlier, right? From studying, from practicing, memorizing, and uh, internalizing, transposing, right? And maybe sometimes they they react to what they are doing right now in the moment, and uh, the idea comes to them right now without previous yep. thought. Did you have those moments in your practice and performance as well, improvisation? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think at its uh, best or at the ideal, improvisation is a mixture of the careful uh, training and preparation one has done over the, the past even years uh, with the inspiration that comes in the moment. Uh, because particularly if one is improvising for... Uh, a, a liturgical service, uh, one has to adjust the timings for if there's a procession uh, that goes longer than expected. One has to be able to react. And it's one of the things I enjoy the most is being able to uh, uh, shape or try to contour by improvising to what's going on in that moment. And in that, the improviser can really sort of set the mood or uh, enhance the mood uh, in the in the the, the uh, moment of what's what's going on, if that makes sense, Absolutely. and I think that if one has the vocabulary, a harmonic vocabulary, you know, being comfortable playing in all keys and various modes. Of course, the the, the French we know are so well grounded in the uh, in the modal uh, method of improvisation. Uh, then then one has the 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 fluency and the language to be able to make something happen. And I advise people to practice transposing hymns and other pieces. And so that one can be really comfortable playing anything in any given key at a particular time. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's really a mixture of where my ear wants to go uh, and where my fingers patterns that my fingers know and remember mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and so forth right right so, robert uh, do you sometimes uh, use existing organ scores as a starting point you know as as a as a blueprint for an idea and you later may uh, expand this idea into your own composition or improvisation sure um so, you know, I, uh, I find that, you know, if I have various ideas, then I, I really do try to um, 
over time help them coalesce. And, um, you know, they, I, I also believe that counterpoint is, a, is a, I mean, people think differently. Some people think really harmonically and some people think, you know, horizontally, we might say, and some people think contrapuntally, vertically. I think I'm more the latter. And I think my principal and proposition teacher was more the former. Mm. Uh, and I hope that I'm not speaking unfairly there. I don't think that one is better than the other. I'm getting off subject a bit here. I apologize. But um, so I, I find that I really think laterally and vertically uh, and in terms of counterpoint. Mm -hmm. And so um, having practiced contrapuntal forms, canon and fugue and uh, other imitative forms, uh, that's one has to really practice practice that it's like riding a bicycle or something you know for it to come back later i'm sorry i think my answer got really off off subject in that I know. regard that's great that's great so robert uh, what's the 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 longest uh, length the, the time in in time right uh, for your improvisation that you ever played in in public uh, how long it was do you remember i'm very conscious of trying not to uh keep playing when the uh, improvisation has, has ended. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would probably say in the context of a recital, maybe 20, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very easy for me generally to sort of keep going and going and going, but that doesn't always make the best improvisation as I'm sure many would agree. Uh, longer doesn't necessarily mean better. Mm -hmm. So I try to be conscious of uh, not letting things get out of proportion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So perhaps, perhaps higher than a short time. I don't. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm, right. So um, it's important not to lose the track of time, right, and uh, to keep telling this story right. in a coherent way, structured way. Just like uh, I don't know, watching a movie or reading a good book, y you you always uh, feel where is the beginning, where is the middle, and where is the end, right? So right. does that yes, uh, is that similar to your approach also? I, I think so, absolutely. And I think you want to leave the listeners wanting more rather than thinking, I wish he had ended, you know, five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you no, know, I'm very conscious of not wanting, perhaps overly conscious, I don't know, of not wanting to take advantage of people's attention, uh, particularly in, uh, in the context of a concert or recital. If I'm improvising in a concert or recital, most often it's, it's the last thing on the program. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, uh, one just wants to be careful about not overextend, uh, overstaying one's welcome. It's an expression that uh, that we use in this country, at least a good bit. Good, very good. Uh, so, so of course, improvisation is very useful for for any organist, right? Not only who is liturgically involved, but also who is playing public, um, you know, in public performances, um, concert performances, right? And uh, people sometimes get um, conscious about trying out new things, and maybe they think. Oh, I'm not a Dupre. I'm not Dupre or Bach, right? Who can who would do these things? But little by little, uh, if if they are brave enough to start, they can they can achieve yes. amazing things. Sometimes, don't you think? I absolutely agree. And oftentimes, um, you know, it can be daunting to start, and uh, one um, has to remember uh, that. Sometimes you just have to be willing to take the risk and it can be much more tiring and it can be much more difficult really at sometimes uh, at times to improvise mm -hmm. because I oftentimes find it easier if I'm, for instance, tired or distracted uh, to play repertoire and, and to still to give it my full attention. Um, and in improvisation, sometimes it requires that extra element of real inspiration and it's a funny thing. I mean, I think even the greatest improvisers have days when uh, they feel that they're not on. Uh, I think everyone has good days and bad days. And with improvisation, you have to be willing to take the risk. And I think that's where the careful practice and preparation comes in. Uh, when one is a, a rehearsed enough improviser, even if one is not the most inspired, uh, you, 
you know, one can still do something that's passable at least, mm -hmm. maybe not the, the greatest thing that will ever come, uh, come out of your fingers, but something that's at least respect, reasonably respectable. Uh, what I should mention, one of my least favorite things to do, and I should be quite honest, is to fill dead space uh, as an improviser. I find it really hard to get inspiration Many organists have probably been in the uh, place where they're playing for a wedding, for instance, and we find out the bride is late, uh, uh -huh. and we're expecting to fill time. And I have to say, I find that incredibly difficult because I'm not inspired in those moments. Also, as an improviser, I try to bring structure to my improvising. And how can you bring structure to something when you have no, long, no idea how long it's going to go on? Uh, it, it could be three minutes or it could be 10 minutes. We hope not, for goodness sakes. But, uh, you know, how do you structure something? And so I find that those are my absolute least enjoyable moments as an improviser. But, of and course... So actually, if I have to do that, I can go for it. But, of course, Robert, at those particular mo moments, you as an organist are indispensable, right? Because the bride is late or something is going wrong with the ceremony and nobody, is one, nobody wants to have this dead space, right? And you save the day, right? right? The ceremony. And even though it's difficult for you to do this um, artistically pleasing way and feel inspired and romantic about it, but, but it works, you know, because of you. It, it does the job, and I'm sure that in the moment, most people don't think twice about it. You know, they're, they're not there, I suppose, to analyze and be critical of the uh, organist's uh, structure in his or her improvisation. So I just try to get on with it. And if I'm really feeling not inspired, I might keep a volume of, you know, of a fairly straightforward repertoire that I can just sort of go through and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and play. So these are the moments we find ourselves in. So, Robert, uh, how, do, how do people react to your improvisations? For example, when you play a new organ piece, a premiere of the modern composed work, written down work, not by you, but, for example, by any living composer, right? A premiere. And in comparison to your own improvisation, which mm -hmm. works, um, I mean, uh, better for the listener, in your opinion? How uh, do people um, admit or not admit, uh, appreciate improvisation better than unfamiliar organ repertoire? I think people are generally, uh, in terms of general audiences, and not even musicians really, uh, I think people are fascinated by improvisation, by the concept of sort of creating something out of nothing, as it were, even though, of course, it's not actually out of nothing, uh, but it seems that way. Uh, and um, and I, I find that people respond very well. In fact, occasionally I've been a little frustrated in playing recital. I mean, I appreciate uh, any, any you know, kind remarks that anyone has, of course, uh, but I've been a little frustrated when I've been worked hard at a particular piece of repertoire and felt pleased with how it went. Uh, and uh, somebody might say they enjoyed that, and, uh, but usually it's the improvisation that gets the most um, appreciation, which I should uh, take as a compliment, and of course I'm honored by that. But I found that, um, that it's, it's funny that, you know, it seems that what uh, people find the most impressive or enjoyable. And people often say, oh, the recital was wonderful, uh, and, uh, but it was the improvisation that I loved. Maybe that I don't play repertoire very well. I certainly hope not, for goodness sakes. But uh, that's that's often been my experience. Great. So, if you, Robert, go back in time when you first started playing the organ, uh, what would be the number one thing you wish you knew when you first started uh, improvising? Let's say, what would have helped you in the beginning? Oh goodness, that's a very difficult question. Um, I suppose. I could just fall back on the uh, the the old advice simply to to practice very hard. Uh, you know, I guess there. If I look back, I think that there are times I've worked. To, wish I had worked a little bit harder. Perhaps I wish I had um, done more theory study at an earlier age. Even though I did some regularly, perhaps I uh, might say do more theory harmony counterpoint study mm -hmm. earlier. 
uh, and uh, that will that will help you progress even faster. That's probably the best I can. It's a very good question, but that's probably the best I can think of. A very good question you asked, is perhaps not the greatest answer, but. Um, there we have it. There is no wrong answer to this. Personal opinion, it's what it's, it matters. So thank you so much, Robert, for your time and insights. And before we end this conversation, Robert, can you give our listeners a link where they can find you and your work online? Uh, yes, um, there are two links. Uh, one is uh, the, uh, the church where I recently began a new position in Philadelphia. Uh, St. Mark's Church on Locust Street. It's an Episcopal church. Uh, and the web address is uh, stmarksphiladelphia.org. And that's with the word saint spelled out, S-A-I-N-T, stmarksphiladelphia.org. And then just in uh, May, I uh, uh, signed on with Philip Truck and Broad Concert Artist, which of course uh, represents a number of uh, fine American organists and some international artists as well. Uh, and that's they're they're in the process of developing a new website, which should be launched by the end of the month. So at the moment, the the current website is just being kept as as up to date as possible while the new one is developed. Uh, but that's concert artists plural artists dot com concert artists dot com. Amazing! Thank you so much, uh, Robert, for for your for sharing your organ journey and improvisation journey in particular. And I wish you amazing creative adventures this year and the next year and uh, stay in good health you as well thank you it was my pleasure i'm happy to speak to you thank you so much thank you if you liked this conversation i encourage you to visit my blog secrets of organ playing at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights practical advice and training for every area of organ playing you can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus. Thanks for listening. And I'll catch you online really soon.